we have a pretty good handle on what the determinant tells us about a matrix, but remember, matrices represent linear maps. So maybe what we should do is come back to the point of view of linear maps and ask ourselves um, if we have a linear map where v and w are arbitrary finite dimensional vector spaces, um, what, does the de what would it mean to define the determinant of that linear map? Um, the sensible thing to do is to say that the determinant of a matrix, or the determinant of a linear map, is just the determinant of some representation of that linear map, so relative to some bases. Um, and this, right, this, I mean, this is really the only way to go about it, um, which tells us immediately, first of all, that for this to make any sense, uh, the dimension of V has to be equal to the dimension of W so that this representing matrix is square, right? We only have a determinant for square matrices. So, <clears throat> so the dimensions of V and W had better be equal, but because this matrix depend because this representing matrix depends on the bases, this is kind of suspicious because, you know, if you choose different bases, you get a different matrix that represents the linear transform the linear map. Um, so it seems like, well, you know, since we could choose these two bases for, B, uh, for V and W, you know, independently because they're different vector spaces, um, there's no real reason to expect that, uh, that taking the determinant of the representing matrix will give us the same thing for every choice of bases. So this is a little suspicious, but to really figure out if this will work or not, we're going to have to think about what happens to this representing matrix if you change one of the two bases here. So to set that up, um, let's have a linear map. And suppose we start with a basis B for V and D for W. Then this gives us a, a matrix that represents the linear map. And we're going to ask what happens if we switch to different bases for V and for W. So B hat for V and D hat for W. Um, this gives us a, a matrix rep b hat d hat of h. Usually this is a different matrix, right? In most cases, if you switch the basis, you, uh, if you change a basis, you change the representing matrix. But these two, uh, these two matrices ought to be related to each other somehow, um, probably something involving the bases, since that's what we're changing. Um, so let's see if we can figure out what the relationship is. Uh, so. Uh, what is the diagram that defines rep BD of H? Well, we have a vector space W, a linear map, our linear map H, sorry, vector space V, linear map H goes to W, and then there's a representation map for the basis B that takes us to Rn, and a representation map for uh, W for the basis D that takes us to, and usually we would write Rm here, but remember we said for any of this, uh, actually no, <laughs> we can write Rm. So we will, when we come back to talking about determinants, we will be interested in the case where this space is actually Rn, but in general it could be some other, uh, uh, some other Euclidean space. All right, so uh, the matrix down here represents H relative to these bases. So we call this either capital H or the long name for it would be rep BD of little h. Now we need to somehow get the other bases and this other matrix into this picture. Um, but I mean, how can we do that, right? We can't just draw a completely separate, separate diagram a completely separate square to get this matrix, because then how are those squares related? It's not clear. But what we can do is, right, the, if we did draw that square, the top line would be the same, right? Because this is the linear map that we're trying to represent. Well, we can, uh, the only thing that would be, would be different are the vertical maps, the representation maps, because the bases are different. Well, we can fit more representation maps in here. If we have another copy of V over here, we could have the representation uh, relative to b hat over here. And if we had a, another uh, copy of w up here, we could have the representation map uh, relative to d hat over here. 
but we need to connect things up across the top so that the map going from V to W is still the same linear map H. So how can we do that? Well, we can just put the identity map for V right here and put the identity map for W right here. Right, the identity map is the map that doesn't do anything. So if you start with a vector v, and then you do nothing, you still have v. And then if you do h, now you have h of v. And then if you do nothing, then you have h of v still. So, so across the top, we're still going from a vector v to a vector h of v. So it's the same map across the top. Um, but because uh, starting in the up far upper left and the far upper right, because the downward maps are relative to our new bases, when we take the matrix so we're going to end up with Rn down here and Rm down here. If whatever matrix goes from this corner to that corner, this will be rep b hat d hat uh, of h, right? Because if, if you sort of ignore the inside part of the diagram and look just at the outside corners, that is the diagram that defines this representation matrix. Um, but what this diagram tells us is that uh, we can write rep b hat d hat of h, so the matrix for h relative to this other basis. Incidentally, why don't we call this capital H hat? We can write this um, as a product of matrices for each of these three steps. Right? We already have a name for what matrix is in this middle step. Um, the matrix down here is going to be the matrix, the n by n matrix that represents the identity map, but relative to these two different bases. Right? If you use the same basis for your, if you are going from V to V and you want to represent the identity map, if you use the same basis, you get the identity matrix. But if you use different bases on the domain and codomain side, you don't usually get the identity matrix. So we get some other matrix here. Um, call it, I don't know what to call it. Uh, how about I don't know, A. I mean, really, uh, why don't I just give it its name? It, it's rep b hat b of the identity of v. And then over here, we get another matrix. This is the uh, representation of the identity matrix for do, uh, the identity map for w relative to the bases d and d hat. Okay. Now, notice this over here, it's b hat and then b. And that's because on the left, we have b hat. On, on the right, we have b. Here it's d hat, a d, d hat, because on the left we have d, and on the right we have d hat. OK. So um, what this whole diagram tells us is that the representation of b hat, d hat, uh, representation relative to b hat, d hat of h is this big product of matrices. Remember that uh, when you multiply matrices, it's sort of the opposite order of this diagram. So rep d d hat of the identity on w uh, times the rep b d of h, right? This is what we called h, times rep b hat b on uh, the identity of v. OK. So, um, so we can express so we can express the matrix for this the matrix for H relative to this other basis just by taking our original rep representing matrix and multiplying it on the right and the left by these matrices that somehow represent the identity matrix relative to these different bases in V over here and D in W over here. Um, now there are two things to point out about these uh, these two matrices. These are called transition matrices because they represent the identity, but they just switch. Um, they change what basis we're using for the representation. So they're called transition matrices. Um, and the the two things to notice about these are uh, so first of all the Right. It might seem confusing at first to have the hats in different places, but rep b b hat for the identity of v, this is the inverse of rep b hat b 
for the identity of V. It's, right, the in, in, this is in the sense of an inverse matrix. And the reason is because, I mean, if you do the identity in V relative to B, and then B hat over here, and then you do the identity in V again, uh, sorry, B hat here, and B there, okay, so here we have Rn, 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 Okay, so um, going from V to V, well, looking at the outside corners of this diagram, what we have is uh, the identity matrix, or the identity map for V across the top, uh, representation relative to B here and here. Right, so that means going, and so if we represent the identity map relative to the same basis in, in the domain and codomain side, we get the identity matrix down here. So this product of matrices across the bottom is the identity matrix. But that means that whatever matrices show up here and here have to be inverse matrices, right? Well, this one is here, this one is there. We just said they're inverses, so that, that's what I said, or that's what I claimed, that they were inverses, so they are. Um, the second thing to notice about these transition matrices is how we get them. Um, um, since they are representation matrices, we get them in the usual way, right? So let me just give myself a little space here. So how do we usually get representation matrices, right? We take a basis vector from our uh, domain side basis, we hit it with the linear map, and then we write the result in terms of the codomain side basis, right? So we get some coefficients here, C1j times the, this gamma one is uh, in the basis for uh, the codomain, codomain side, plus dot dot dot, plus C uh, m j gamma m Right? And then you pull out these coefficients, and these coefficients give you a column of the representing matrix. Well, we can do exactly the same thing to find these representation, ma these uh, transition matrices. It's just that the linear map is the identity map, so we, uh, we don't need to write it because the identity map applied to some basis vector is just the basis vector. Right? But what we need to do is write this in terms of the new basis. So that would be C1J times, uh, so I guess in this case, uh, we're going to beta hat. So we would say beta hat one plus dot 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 plus C uh, N J beta N hat, right? So, uh, so in this case for a transition matrix, we're just pulling off these coefficients. We're taking the coefficients uh, for one basis that express the other basis vectors. All right, and then, of course, if we, ha if we calculated rep b, b hat when we wanted rep b hat b, we could just take an inverse matrix because of what we said a second ago. Okay, so with all of this set up this way, let's actually work out an example. So let's find the, the map or this map, this linear map from R2 to P1 defined by this, um, let's find its, its representing matrix matrices relative to, we'll always use the standard basis on the R2 side, but on the P1 side, let's use two different bases. So we'll do it once with uh, relative to this basis D, and we'll do it again with this other basis D hat. So first relative to D, uh, remember how we find the representing uh, the representing matrix is we do rep D of H of a basis element, and we're using the standard basis on the R2 side, so that's like this. So we need to know what is rep D of, uh, so what is H of 1, 0? It's 1, uh, it's 1 plus 2x. Okay, and the uh, 
coordinates for 1 plus 2x relative to the basis d. Remember, it just pulls off the coefficients relative, uh, of these basis vectors. Well, it's already written in terms of those basis vectors, so it's just 1 and 2. OK, and now rep d of h of 0, 1 is that's rep d of, so what is h of 0, 1? That's uh, minus 2 minus 3x. And the rep d of this is minus 2 minus 3. OK. And remember, each one of these gives us a column of the representing matrix. So rep b d of h is 1, 2, minus 2, minus 3. OK. So now let's find the uh, representing matrix relative to this other basis. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this formula up here. Uh, and uh, when we do that, you know, we might be uncertain when we're done that we actually have a matrix that represents the map relative to these other bases. Um, but what we'll do is we'll check it using a vector. So we'll put one vector in here and see what comes out, and it will be the right thing. So. All right, so we have, uh, we have the representing matrix relative to this first basis. So what we need to do now is find uh, these two transition matrices. This first one is, uh, is straightforward because for this particular example, right, we need the identity matrix in R2 or sorry, the identity map in R2. But in, on the R2 side, we're using the standard basis for both, for, for both representations. So this is rep BB ID of B. And so what's the representation of the identity map uh, relative to a basis and itself? It's always the identity. So this is the 2 by 2 identity. Right? So the only trick is, what is, the, what is this transition matrix over on the d, d hat side? So what is rep d, d hat of the identity matrix, or the identity map over on the p1 side? OK. So how do we calculate this? <laughs> right? this, this is a representing. Uh, representing matrix. So what we need to do is uh, take basis elements from this basis and express them in terms of the other basis. So we need to calculate what is rep d hat of the identity matrix in W, sorry, the identity map in W applied to one of the basis elements from uh, from D. So for example, 1. OK. Well, the first step of this is easy, because rep D hat of the identity map applied to 1 is just 1. But how do we express 1 in terms of these basis vectors? I mean, we know in principle it's possible. Uh, Actually, this one's easy, because uh, this first basis vector is a half. So it's going to be 2. But if, if, we do the, if we try to do the other one, so identity on w for x, um, right now we have to write what is the representation relative to the basis d hat of the polynomial x. And I mean, how do we, how do we write this? How do we write x in terms of these basis vectors? You know, in general, so for this particular example, it's actually still not that bad. But in general, it, it's kind of tricky to, to do this. And the reason that this is coming out so awkwardly is because right, we need to write these nice basis vectors in terms of these messy basis vectors. It would be much easier if we could do this the other way, if we could write these messy basis vectors in terms of the nice basis vectors. Um, in fact, it's so much easier that I would rather do that. Right? Because, and we can, we can do that because we know that right, we need to know rep d, d hat. But that's just the inverse of rep d hat d. 
right? D hat D is the easy one to find, is what I'm saying. So let's find that one and then just calculate its inverse. Um, to calculate rep d hat d of the identity on p1, so I should have p1 here and here. Uh, what we're going to do is take basis vectors from d hat and write them in terms of basis vectors from d. Right? So what is the representation relative to d of a basis vector from d hat? So first basis vector from d hat is a half. And how do we represent that in terms of uh, what coefficients do we need on the basis from d? Well, we need a 1 half times 1 and then a 0 times x. OK, and then how about rep d of the other basis element from d hat? So 3 plus 1 half x. So for this one, well, we need 3 and a half, right? 3 times 1 plus a half times x. So you can see uh, calculating this representing matrix, or this transition matrix from d hat to d, is actually a lot easier than finding the one from d to d hat. So now we know that the representation from d, the representing, tra <laughs> the transition matrix from d hat to d is, right, we just take these two vectors and use them as columns. So 1 half, 0, 3, 1 half. OK. Um, and now, if we just take the inverse matrix for this, we get the representation from d to d hat, or the representation of the identity from d to d hat, so this transition matrix. And I won't drag you through calculating this inverse. I've calculated it ahead of time. Uh, we get, turns out it's 2 minus 12, 0, 2. OK. So we found this transition matrix. Remember, what we are going to do is calculate the uh, representation relative to uh, this d hat basis by taking our old matrix, our old representing matrix, multiplying on the right by the identity in this one, and on the left by this matrix that we just found. So let's do the transition matrix we just found times this representation with respect to the old bases. So 1 uh, minus 2, 2 minus 3. Okay, and what do we get? So uh, 1 plus minus 20, so 2 minus 24 minus 22, and then 4, and then second we got, let's see, minus 4 plus 36, so 32, and minus 6. Okay, now this is supposed to represent uh, this is supposed to represent the linear map H with respect to the basis uh, standard basis in R2 and this different basis in P1. So how can we tell if it's actually doing its job? Well, uh, what we can do is take one of the basis elements from here, like say 1, 0, do rep b to it. Right? In this case, rep b just gives us 1, 0 again. And then multiply by this matrix. And what, so what do we get? Minus 22, 32, 4, minus 6. So multiply this by the representation of our basis element from b. We get minus 22 and 4. So, OK, but what is this? This is supposed to be the representation relative to d hat of h of 1, 0. Right? So if we, if we now do the inverse of the representation map for d hat, we ought to get, what we ought to get here is the image of 1, 0. So let's do that. 
what is the uh, inverse of the representation map? Well, that's the map that takes these coefficients and actually puts them in front of the um, puts them in front of the basis elements. So the first basis element was a half plus, and then four times the second basis element. And the second basis element in d hat was what was it? Three plus a half x. OK, so this is supposed to be h of 1, 0. So let's calculate what this is. Minus 11 plus 12 plus 2x. So 1 plus 2x. So this is supposed to be h of 1, 0. And let's check. What is h of 1, 0? If we look at the original formula, h of 1, 0 is 1 plus 2 times 0 x, 1 plus 2x. So it worked, right? OK, so this matrix that we got by multiplying the old representation times this transition matrix did give us the representation relative to this new basis.